a man and a man to woman and uh, talk to you about some of the things that um, I think uh, we need to do in order to make uh, this a better place to live and a better farmers union to, uh, to work with. First, I don't think I have to tell you that we are experiencing this year uh, one of the most unusual uh, years in history. Challenge around the, or the, the uh, need for food, unprecedented world demand for food around the world uh, is greater than ever. We've never seen anything like this before. Agriculture has been beset with uh, transportation problems, marketing problems, inflation, shortages of fuel, fertilizer, other inputs. I just heard that if you order a John Deere tractor, you can expect to wait from 15 to 18 months to get it. And almost everything else that we need to deal with is either on the shortage list or the price has, has doubled or increased. Fertilizer in short demand. At no time in the century have farm prices been as changing as they have in the last year. In September, or in August rather, parity went up above 100 percent. And then in September it went down below 100 percent, and right now it is below 100 percent. And even though it appears that farm prices are pretty good, and they are, but if you're a cattle farmer and you've got some cattle in the feedlot and you're paying two dollars and a quarter for corn, and you can only get $39 a hundred for those cattle, you know that's not a good price. That's a tragedy for cattle feeders. And so even though it looks like farm prices are great, they aren't always so great if you're caught in this cost price squeeze between feed costs and livestock uh, live weight prices. And unfortunately, the price adjustment apparently hasn't been made in the supermarket. And until that's made, and until we get these fat cattle on the market, I guess that's our problem. At least that's what the so-called experts say. And something is a problem because we're in deep trouble on cattle prices today. Well, one of the major needs that we have as farmers is to tell our story to the non-farm public. You know, we represent today only about 5% of the total farm population. Somehow we need to multiply our, uh, our voices to tell our story. Farm prices, you know, as John Weefeld told us last night, have sort of stayed in place for the last 20 years until just a few months ago. And during the time that the price of everything that we have to sell was just sort of hanging there, I think John said in 20 years, farm prices increased only 6%, while everything else was doubling or tripling. And just, you know, think of a few things that you've bought in the last few years. Television sets. I know they've more than doubled in the last 20 years. Automobiles. 20 years ago, you could buy a new Ford or a new Chevrolet for about half the going price today. Tractors, and uh, you name it, and prices have doubled. And yet, just in a few short months, farm prices finally caught up. And this, of course, is what's shaken the consumer and had an impact that's rocked our market structure such as it's never been rocked before. Now, the commodity exchange markets, which are being talked a lot about today, really didn't work to the advantage of the farmer during the past few years. Who ever heard of $12 beans at the farm level? Well, I don't think anybody did. Farmers sold their beans for $3, $3 and a half last fall. But along about last spring, late winter, beans were worth $12. Somebody made the difference. And it wasn't the farmer, but somebody made the difference between $3 beans and $12 beans. And this is the kind of manipulating that we've seen by the uh, commodities futures market, and uh, I'm happy to see in the newspapers that they're being investigated and recommendations are being made uh, for changing the uh, futures market uh, system. And the Farmers Union was the first to call uh, for that kind of an investigation. Well, we have a new farm program. Frank Denholm said today, Tony, that that's the best farm program that this country has ever had. In spite of the fact that he said, he said it wasn't good enough, it didn't have all the Denholm features in it, but nonetheless, it was the best farm program that this country has ever had. And I believe that's true. The target prices are not high enough, you know, uh, but let's face it, $2.05 for wheat is a lot higher than a dollar and a quarter for wheat that we had up until this year, and a dollar thirty-eight cents for corn is a lot higher than 98 cent corn. 
And while it's barely a cost of production figure, it is a, a, a new um, direction in farm programs, and we hope to build on that. It is a victory for family farmers, and we hope to build on the foundation of the new farm program as we move along. Well, while we've been gaining on the income front, uh, you know, we've, we've faced some other unprecedented problems. I've mentioned the fuel shortage, nipping at the wheels of the farmer's tractor all summer and spring, and now we're facing a critical propane shortage, uh, and we have uh, mandatory controls on propane, but as somebody has said here already today, that's not going to produce one more gallon of propane. We're still going to have to live with what we've got, and uh, the allocation will be there, and we may benefit or we may not benefit, as the case may be, from this new allocation. The energy crisis uh, is, is a serious situation, and the solution, whatever it is, is going to be long-term. But it's time that, uh, that we get at it and uh, begin to make some plans for, for looking at long-term uh, energy solution. Fertilizers in short supply. My guess is that before next spring rolls around or before you get your crops planted next spring, you'll find that you'll be unable to buy a fertilizer, at least the type of fertilizer that you want to get the job done. The problem is that the foreign prices for fertilizer are so attractive that it's draining off a lot of our domestic product and somehow we've got to come to grips with that and I don't know the answer. Uh, Denholm says that we need to uh, take the price lid off of fertilizer and uh, farmers are allowed to pay more but he says that he guesses we can afford it. Uh, whatever the answer is, we need to deal with that one. Transportation. I said today earlier that that's probably the greatest ongoing problem that rural farmers face today. If you've, if you've watched what's happening, and I'm sure you have, as far as rail transportation in this state of ours is concerned, you've seen a continued, almost systematic decline of rail transportation. We've got 10 mile an hour track, we've got five mile an hour track, We've got runs that used to go from here to Oaks, North Dakota and back in 14 hours that now take 44 hours and two crews and lousy service. And then we wonder why shippers are looking to alternative ways to ship grain. But the fact is, there is no real alternative for shipping grain by rail. Rail is by far the most efficient. From the standpoint of fuel, they tell us it's six to one, has a six to one advantage over, uh, over highway uh, truck transportation. And the trucks tearing up the highways, the railroad companies are tearing up the railroad tracks, Emil. So we're losing both ways. Those of you who go to Mitchell or drive down Highway 34, uh, down here from Woonsocket all the way to Howard, have witnessed just this fall the, uh, the elimination of a railroad that's been there, I guess, for 70 or 80 years, maybe longer, and has served a community a good productive community. Now when you drive along Highway 34, you see right to the north of the highway a railroad bed. The tracks are gone, most of the ties are gone, and it's a deserted and abandoned railroad track. And this is happening all over the country, in rural America particularly. And we've made some recommendations. And one of them is that we take a good hard look at the possibility of the, either the state or the federal government acquiring the rail beds. Now, Vermont went into this program about nine years ago. They bought a spur line of 105 miles for something a little over $2 million, bought from the railroad company. They rebuilt the bed and then leased it back to the railroad company on a long-term lease. And so now the state of Vermont owns three railroad tracks in that state. They're not making money. They don't expect to make money, but they've got railroad service. Now somebody's going to say, well, gee, isn't that socialistic? Well, I don't know. South Dakota has a cement plant, and that makes money for the state. South Dakota owns that highway, Highway 34, that runs parallel to that railroad track, or the state and South Dakota own it. It's publicly owned. Nobody thinks that's socialistic. But yet when we talk about the state or the nation owning railroads, all at once that becomes socialistic. Well, I think we need to just clear the cobwebs out of our minds in this kind of uh, thinking and, and say, in fact, 
that whatever system best serves the public, best serves the people of our country and state, that's what we'd ought to do, and not get entangled in philosophy as to whether this is socialistic or whether it isn't. And so I suggest that we do take a hard look at that possibility of going the route that New Hampshire or that Vermont did and maybe buying some railroad beds before it's too late. Because just as sure as we're sitting here tonight, if we do nothing for the next 20 years, as we've done nothing for the last 20 years except hold meetings and seminars and talk about the problem, if we do nothing for the next 20 years, there won't be a railroad running in South Dakota. And if you want to see a railroad and a railroad track, you're going to have to go over here to uh, Prairie Village, over at Madison, where they've just bought an old locomotive, and they're going to have five miles of railroad track over there. They're going to run just to show the kids what a railroad used to look by. And if that's what you want, then let's just all go home and not do anything more than we've been doing. But if we want to save our railroads so that when the price of wheat is $5 in Minneapolis and we want to sell wheat, we can get a car to put it in and a track to take it there, then we'd better do something. Otherwise, we'll be sitting out here reading in the paper about $5 wheat, but nobody's going to buy it because there's no way to transport it in and get it there in time to match that $5 price. <clears throat> so let's, you know, that's a heck of a way to run a railroad. Let's show the people how to run a railroad, and it's up to us. Emil Lorex and many of the rest of you have shown a keen interest in this. And Emil, let's, let's give this a real go, see what we can do. Sure, sure, pollution. Trucks have, you know, much more pollution on the highway than the, than the locomotive does on the track. And the, and the fuel saving is six to one, Emil. Okay, I better move on, because this is Tony's night. A year ago, when we were here, uh, we were talking about the Farmers Union lawsuit as far as property taxes were concerned. You remember we challenged the constitutionality of South Dakota's tax law. We said that it was unfair to school children and taxpayers because it took more of the people's money who lived in the poor district to run a good school and it took of the money of the, of the people in a rich district to run a, a given school. And we thought we had a good case and uh, we had hopes of winning that case. But last spring, a case very similar to ours, I think it's called the Rodriguez case uh, from the state of Texas, went to the Supreme Court and they were denied by a vote of five to four at the Supreme Court. Now this after uh, Nixon had put a couple of his uh, appointees on the Supreme Court. Tony, I think if we'd have been there a couple of years early, we'd have won that case. And so well, now we're back looking at the legislature again if we'd have won that case, it would have forced the hands of the legislature, and, and the tax reform would have been almost automatic. Now we're back uh, doing what we can at the legislative front. South Dakota maintains the, the distinction, if you will, of having the people of our state pay more property tax in relation to our income than is the case of any other state in the nation. I think we want to correct that. And I'm sure that Farmers Union will be there at the forefront making the effort this year as we have in the past. And let me say that, I, um, that I've experienced in my visits with people considerable uh, discouragement this year, uh, you know, as far as the possibility of maybe getting tax legislation out of this legislature. I don't feel that way. Now, we may not get the whole hog. We may have to go piecemeal. The Legislative Research Council has recommended a proposal uh, that would put a corporation tax and business franchise tax on the businesses of South Dakota to raise enough money to repeal the personal property tax. And this would include a tax on professional people, doctors, lawyers, veterinarians. And I'll tell you, once these guys have to pay an income tax, they'll see that everybody has to pay one. So we may have to go at this piecemeal and knock off the top row first, and then after that get a comprehensive uh, a tax reform measure that will include a graduated income tax uh, for all those who have an income. You know, ownership of property is really no indication of ability to pay taxes. And let's get off of that, that old antiquated uh, proposition and get to a modern tax system. And I think there's a real possibility that we'll get started this year. Let's not be disappointed if we don't get it all, but let's get a piece of it. Again, a year ago at this convention, we were talking about Farmers Union intervention in the Bell Telephone rate increase request. See, you almost forgot about that, didn't you? But a year ago, we were in the middle of an intervention 
between the Bell Telephone and its users before the Public Utility Commission. They were asking uh, for a return on their investment of 9.5%. Uh, you know, how do you like to have that kind of a guaranteed return on your investment? They are already guaranteed a return of 6.9, almost 7%. But they went to the PUC last summer and asked for a right to make 9.5% a return on their investment. Well, we hired a lawyer and appeared in behalf of the people of the state uh, to oppose that increase in rates. Uh, shortly after our announcement, East River Electric sent their representative over, and then the South Dakota Consumers League got into the act, and the three of us challenged the rate increase, <clears throat> and the Public Utility Commission denied that rate increase. All right, what did that mean to the telephone users of South Dakota? And let me say that if Bell had gotten that rate increase, no doubt it would have soon spread across the state to all the other independents. But nine, or that increase that Bell Telephone wanted would have raised the telephone costs in South Dakota in one year, $5,800,000. Their own attorneys estimated this, nearly $6 million increase in rates. Broken down to customer, this would have amounted to about $36 for a connected telephone. Well now, you know, we didn't do this alone, we had some allies, but I'm convinced that it was because of our original challenge uh, that, we, that the allies came in and that the PUC denied that rate increase. So we all made $36 a piece, those that, uh, of us who have a telephone. Tony, that would pay the dues for a little while, wouldn't it? Now that's not to say that Bell is not going, well, as a matter of fact, I think they've taken their course to the U.S. or to the South Dakota Supreme Court. They brought their case back to the PUC. The PUC denied them a second time, and uh, their recourse under state law is to go to the Supreme Court. So we'll see, but I feel um, somewhat satisfied that the Supreme Court is not going to give them a, a free blank check for 9.5% on their investment. So whatever they finally arrive at, I'm sure that uh, we're going to have a savings as a result of of Farmers Union's intervention in this particular situation. Now a major disappointment on the legislative front for the last two or three years has been our failure to pass a corporate farm bill in South Dakota or a family farm act as we uh, would prefer to call it. And we've certainly tried. And on two different occasions, including last winter, we did get our bill through one house of the legislature only to see it falter and fall in the second house. Last year we got it through the house and it failed in the Senate. We're going to keep trying. Land prices are increasing. And I just sort of have the feeling that high-priced land and high-priced crops may well just whet the appetite of corporations that want to get into agriculture. And think, for instance, of the retiring farmer who wants to sell his farm, and uh, his kids uh, all have a job uh, in the city and don't want to farm, he's going to look to the buyer with the most money. And who's that going to be? That's going to be a corporation, as often as not. And so I think it may be even more important now, with high land prices and high farm prices, for as long as they last at least, that we do everything we can to pass a Family Farm Act. Minnesota passed one last year. And it was a good one. It was patterned, uh, well, not patterned, but very much like the one that we've been trying to pass. And I think I know why Minnesota passed theirs and we didn't pass ours. Now, that, you know, uh, it's always easy to find a, a scapegoat when you, when you don't get the job done. But in watching television during the Minnesota legislative session, on at least two occasions, I saw Governor Anderson on the television tube vigorously supporting the Family Farm Act in the Minnesota legislature. I saw John Weefelt, the Secretary of Agriculture over there, doing the same thing. The bill in the Minnesota legislature was introduced by Alec Olson, who is the President of the Senate in Minnesota and a former congressman. They put prestige behind their bill. And this, I think, is what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to somehow uh, get our governor involved and our Secretary of Agriculture, and incidentally, Governor Knipe introduced the first corporation farm bill. It was introduced into the South Dakota legislature back in 1969, I think it was. 
And Eamon, we need to get him hitched up again and get this, this prestige behind the bill. And I think we may get that done this year if we all work hard and if we get the kind of cooperation uh, that we need. Well, these are the things that we need to do, and we really need to care. They tell the story of the, of the horse trader who was trying to sell a horse. And, he, and, and the buyer came along, and the buyer looked the horse over real good, and he looked him right in the eye, looked the horse in the eye. And the buyer said, and the, and the seller said, wait a minute now, the buyer said to the seller, that horse is blind. And the horse trader said, no, he's not blind. It just looks like it. And, but the fellow, the prospective buyer said, no, I, I'll bet that horse is blind. The, the horse trader insisted that he wasn't. So finally, the prospective buyer just slipped the halter off the horse. They were standing right next to the barn. And he slapped the horse on the rear end, and the horse took off, and he ran right smack into the barn. I mean, head on into the barn. And the prospective buyer said to the horse traders, he said, see, I told you that horse was blind. And the horse trader said, no, he's not blind. He just doesn't give a damn. You know, and it really doesn't make all that much difference, does it, whether you're blind or whether you don't give a darn. What we need to do is really care, and maybe we'll get these things done. I'm not sure that we've worked hard enough. Well, all this brings me back to what I started out with, and that's our need to tell our story uh, to uh, non-farm people, to other groups, to coalitions, and we've done our job. We've put together coalitions at the national level as well as the state level. We hold one of the best farmer worker conferences in the country. Uh, we've seen a coalition of uh, farm unity at the national level. We need to do all of these things if we're going to get the job done. We need to talk to non-farm people in South Dakota. Just recently, I was invited to speak to the annual meeting of the South Dakota Municipal League. And that's an opportunity. We need to get invited to Kiwanis clubs, service clubs, chambers of commerce, and tell our story. It, all this is an important link in the chain that we'll need to put together to win the goals that are not only goals for farmers, but goals for rural America, which in turn makes our whole country prosper. Our challenge, and it seems to me, is clear. We must work harder than ever before to save the family farm system and to bring a new era of vitality to rural America. Thank you. Tony has a long time history with Farmers Union. He's a Kansas farm boy. Worked his way up into the Farmers Union organization was national secretary, and now is the National Farmers Union president. But he's more than that. He's a national figure and an international figure. And when the farm bill was passed in Washington last winter, Tony Deschamps was right at the forefront in putting the pieces together and getting the job done. And when the IFAP, which is the International Farm Organization, meets and makes decision is Tony Deschamps, who's sitting at the head table, helping to make those decisions. And let me say, in, in all frankness, and I know of no person in the United States who has more influence on what happens in, in, on agricultural uh, issues uh, than Tony Deschamps. Tony, it's my pleasure to introduce you to this fine group. Thank you very much. Thank you. President Ben, Vice President Adam, Secretary Lee, longtime good friend uh, John McKay, former National Secretary, and as I've said on several occasions from this platform, one of the men who played a role in bringing me into the Farmers Union, Emil Lorix, Cliff Ott, our state insurance manager. Cliff, are you with us? Um, Cliff uh, was less than Donna, wasn't it? The queen? Uh, this evening, the insurances had their annual award dinner, and we've got a new queen, a new insurance uh, queen for the state, 
and it's Donna Eberlein, and she is queen uh, because she makes a very wonderful secretary for Les. She's a great helpmate, and of course she's queen because Les wrote the most insurance. I guess that would be the, the thing, uh, Cliff. So join me in giving uh, the new king and queen a hand. Gary Eisenbrun of our Green Thumb program here in, uh, in South Dakota. Um, the pioneers that were intervie interviewed by Ben uh, earlier this evening and uh, the wonderful county presidents that came to the platform to pick up the new podium. I got an invitation to come and use one of those new podiums, Ben. I thought that was tremendous, the fact that 34 counties in a three-year period increased their, uh, how did that go, Ben? Over a three-year average. Over a three-year average uh, uh, increased percentage-wise their membership. I think that's wonderful. Members and uh, friends of the South Dakota, South Dakota Farmers Union, as always, I'm delighted to be here. I missed being with you last year. I was up in Ottawa at an IFAP meeting, uh, but my heart was here the night that uh, I would have been on your program. Ben, I'm, uh, I'm reminded of a convention a few years ago, a couple of years ago, in Washington, D.C., where we had a big sign up behind the stage, and it said, Parody Now. And a very fine congressman from Wisconsin, one of the great congressmen in the United States Congress, Henry Royce, when he was introduced to uh, speak, he walked to the podium, looked at the sign, and he said, parody, no, uh, parody now. He said, I hope the day when will come when we can say, parody, wow. Uh, and this, this last year, we saw farm prices go over the 100% of parody. Al, for the first time since way back in 1952. Uh, and uh, it was a, a banner period for farmers. And our challenge is to make sure that it stays and that it doesn't slide back down. I couldn't help but hear Henry Vins when he was interviewed a while ago and, and uh, uh, expressed concern about how easy it is to produce a little bit too much and how fast prices uh, come down. I hope that is behind us. And our challenge uh, in the Farmers Union, as well as other organizations, is to make sure that we do not again go back to those prices that put us down at the bottom of the economic totem pole. Well, what a year. What a year we've had. When I think back of last fall, and let me just skip for a few minutes just a year ago and move to late in 1960, in 1972, when without warning, the president and the administration, other, other members of the, uh, of the administration, drastically cut farm programs. You remember REAP was cut out, REA loans, the the FHA emergency loans, it was a long list. I remember testifying before a House Agriculture Committee and talking about what a tremendous list, what a tremendous blow it was. And as we went into uh, 1973, if anybody had come to me and said, what are our chances of passing a farm bill uh, this year, 1973, I, I would have said very slim. In fact, you'll remember the Kiplinger's farm letter came out and said uh, on January 19 that the chances of passing any kind of a farm bill was very, very poor. And then Watergate bust out. It burst out on the nation, and the climate started changing. And all of a sudden, the Congress uh, decided that Maybe they could and should do something. Maybe they should start reclaiming some of the power, 
some of the responsibility that they've abrogated in recent years. A lot of more senators decided maybe they ought to join such agricultural fighters as we've had in George McGovern and Hubert Humphrey and others on the farm front. They've been lone voices crying, and they didn't get much support, and the same was true on the House side. And all of a sudden, it was a new day. I'm a great believer that things do not happen accidentally. Very few times in my life have I seen anything real good happen accidentally just because it suddenly busted out and happened. You have to make things happen. And I want to commend you people here in South Dakota when no one else in the Farmers Union was talking about maybe taking a look at what we're doing and maybe thinking about moving in some new directions when no one was doing it. You people here in South Dakota had the temerity to talk about it and to come to your conventions and do something about it. And you prodded and you pushed others in the Farmers Union family uh, to think about something else. And out of it came a different look. Out of it came at least wanting to take a different approach. And then when a Watergate happens, and all of a sudden it's possible to move in a different direction, at least there had been some testimony. At least there had been some talking. At least there were some things down on paper that pointed to new and possible ways. As Ben indicated a few minutes ago in quoting Congressman Denholm, we got a, a new farm uh, bill. I wish it could have been a better farm bill. It fell far short of Farmers Union's goal, of Farmers Union's objective, but it established a concept because all we really had to look forward to early this year was a renewal of the 1970 Farm Act. There, On the one side, there were those of us who were determined that we were going to improve it some. And on the other side stood Secretary Butts and the conservatives aiding and abetting Secretary Butts in trying to weakened the 70 Farm Act to give him greater authority than he had. And that looked like that was what the ball game was going to be. A simple extension of existing legislation, hopefully bettered, or uh, a, a bill that was more flexible. But along came Watergate, as I said, and along came a new farm bill, and it has two important things in it. For the first time, it set a floor for agricultural products, at least for uh, three or four of the main ones. It set a floor for wheat, feed grains, cotton, and they moved a milk, manufacturing milk, to 80% of support price uh, for the first year. It had one additional factor. It set a cost of production index into play. Now, the Senate came out with a bill that well, let's just talk about corn, $1.53, that was 70% of parity. The House decided, worried about a veto, they moved it down to 63% of parity. And the Secretary of Agriculture wanted to move it down to 50% of parity, or $1.26 a bushel. They watered down the escalator clause, the production, uh, to apply only on the last two years. But the important thing is that a concept was established, and if we can do something in 1974 to make sure that we don't have as much veto threat as we have now, and I was pleased, Ben, to note that you had Pat Greathouse on the program and our good friend uh, uh, Cliff Schrader, because the AFL CIO is meeting down in uh, Florida and they are determined that they're going to do whatever they can to make sure that 
good legislation will not be vetoed and then sustained by the Congress as it has seven times already this year. And I think it behooves us on the agricultural front to take a good hard look in the months ahead in terms of what we're going to do to be helpful on that front. Now, let me just say a word about the Farm Bill and how it was put together. We had the best coalition going uh, that Reuben Johnson and I can remember going for a long, long time. And those of you who are going to be at the breakfast tomorrow morning will uh, see some slides that Reuben has prepared to show you the, the relationship, to show you the, the harmony, the concert that worked between labor and the farmers' union. Because at the same time that we had a farm bill going, we had a minimum wage law going. And I can't remember of any time that I stood shoulder to shoulder outside the door of the House of Representatives, outside of the place where they do their voting, with labor to watch them file in and file out and let them know we were there and let them know how we wanted to vote. The key thing was that labor said the farmers are entitled to a floor. The farmers are entitled to a minimum price. Now, although that minimum price that we got is a sorry price, and although it is a long way from where it should be because of that veto threat, but the important thing is that labor and consumer groups agreed and stood shoulder to shoulder with us and worked with us to make sure that that concept, that that idea that labor has to have a minimum wage that's adequate, and they were willing to fight with us shoulder to shoulder that farmers are entitled to have the same kind of a floor, the same kind of a minimum wage. Now that took some doing. It didn't come easy. It was important. The escalator clause, the cost of production. Labor understands cost of living. That's why they understood cost of production. And when the administration mounted an, a campaign, an all-out campaign to destroy that escalator clause, it was labor. It was labor that delivered the votes to save it. And if you'll take a look tomorrow morning at Reuben's material, you'll find that the margin of victory on the farm bill, inadequate as price levels and supports are, the margin on the farm bill and the margin on the minimum wage, which was later vetoed by the president, are the same. We won the farm bill with the biggest vote in, I can't remember when, we won with 100 votes. And we used to win or lose with three and four and five votes. So we put together this year a new ball game for farmers, a new concept, but some real support from friends of farmers who, in a showdown situation, were very helpful. I want to commend your state president for what I think has been the outstanding job of all of the states in the Farmers Union on not only a number of fronts, but two fronts in particular. And one was the energy crisis and the other the transportation crisis. Ben has represented the National Farmers Union at Des Moines and in, in Washington, D.C. on several occasions this last year. He was the chief spokesman for us because he not only spoke with a clear voice here in South Dakota, but because his voice was so clear here in South Dakota, we drafted him to speak for us on the national level. Ben, I commend you for the tremendous job you've done on these issues. Say nothing of the tax issue, but particularly the fuel and the transportation issue. We, we're not so sure we're going to come out so well uh, we, we've already, you know, four months ago, five months ago, I guess it was last, uh, late last spring, uh, we were calling for mandatory allotments, allocations of fuel. Ben was the foremost voice in that, 
and now we've got it on propane. We're pushing hard now, uh, John McKay. We're working as hard as we can to make sure that fertilizer plants will get the natural gas they need to produce uh, nitrogen and, and phosphorus. We're a billion tons shy on nitrogen and 700,000 tons shy on phosphorus. We're moving into the production of the greatest amount of land uh, this coming spring, and we're that short. Uh, and that's why we're saying that if you allocate fuel, you've got to make sure that natural gas goes to the producers uh, of this uh, uh, very necessary fertilizer that farmers need. And I've been saying since last January that we ought to take a look at what kind of thievery went on in this country because it was very simple. The fertilizer producers, in an effort to avoid the president's economic phase, whatever it was, three or three and a half or three and a fourth, Whatever it was, they couldn't sell their fertilizer for enough money here in the United States, so they were selling it overseas at a higher price. And the administration should have moved and, and watched that price thing uh, uh, a little bit closer than they did. Anyway, uh, we hope to get something done on that, Ben. We struck out, I think, yesterday. What is today? Today is uh, Monday. Monday, so we struck out Friday. Uh, in terms of getting an amendment onto the floor, uh, but we still think we can uh, move it on the Senate side. Well, I've been especially looking forward to coming to this convention of the South Dakota Farmers Union this year because this is the home state of Senator George McGovern, who will be addressing you folks tomorrow. Now, let me hasten to add that it does no good to rehash last year's um, presidential election, nor does it do any good to get into those never-ending and unresolvable if he had just done this or just done that arguments. The reality is that George McGovern was not elected president, and my friends, in my humble opinion, the country is worse for it. It is, it is not worse for it because of partisan differences between Democrats and Republicans. The country is worse for it quite simply because George McGovern is an honest American who was quite willing to put his faith in our system of public elections. And day by day, revelation after revelation comes to the front, and it makes all of us sadder day by day that the decision makers in the campaign in one party had so little faith in our democratic processes that they sought to tamper with that most precious right that each of us have, and that is the right of citizenship, the right of the secret ballot, the right of no undue influence uh, uh, where elections are concerned. I got a big bang, Ben, when I was driving through Mitchell today. I flew to, uh, to Sioux Falls and drove over here. And as I was driving through Mitchell, I saw at least three times I saw signs on the back of bumpers that said, don't blame me, I voted for McGovern. <laughs> I think George, if he happens to be in Mitchell, uh, he may enjoy that. Imagine, I, I didn't hear this evening uh, the statement of the vice president. I understand he was on 6.30. Uh, some of you may have heard it, but just imagine in this country a situation where the Vice President of the United States has resigned and by a federal prosecutor, a man who knows the law, a man who knows the full impact 
of what he said. And let me quote what he said. He said that the vice president was nothing more than a common crook and the country is well rid of him. What a sad, what a sad time uh, for America to have that kind of a thing happen. But my friends, while I'm speaking of the corruption of one administration, it should be on all of our consciences. If we really subscribe to the democratic ideals upon which our country is founded, then it is not only the administration in power that is guilty of corruption, petty bribery, and immorality, but it is also us. It is we the people that hold those truths that are written in the Constitution to be self-evident, and we all must share in the guilt. Furthermore, it is we the people who must act now to return morality to the fabric of our governmental institutions. We the people must, as of now, get involved in the caucuses, in the conventions, and in the campaigns, and in the elections of our leaders. I go from state to state, and I'm sorry to say to you that many places that I go to, when I ask for a show of hands on how many have ever gone to a caucus of the party of their choice, the show of hands is so pathetic that it makes one wonder. Or how many have been to a county assembly or to a state convention of the political party of their choice? And yet our democracy is supposed to work, you know. It's supposed to be a two-party system, and we're supposed to make it work by participating, by being informed and participating at all levels in the selection of candidates. And that's why I say it's very important for us to get involved, to get involved early in the game, because this country can't take any more or too many more Watergates or much more corruption and much more skull skullduggery because then our young people, those young couples may very well throw up their hands and say, what's the use? And remember, that's how some great democratic governments fell when you read the history of the world. That's why I say this evening, I would like to have all of you consider the concept of public financing of our national campaigns. I think it's tremendously important. We can't go on having $60 million presidential campaigns with the candidates' war chests filled to the brim and which huge, with huge contributions from corporations and industrialists and others who have done so much to corrupt our government, I'd submit that this money, it's that money that stands between us really and making our government work effectively so that the, the office holder, be he president or be he senator or be he vi uh, congressman, so that he can really have some rapport with the rank and file people in his, that he uh, uh, governs. I'm hoping that we can, and it, we have a hundred congressmen signing a bill, many senators. It's the kind of public financing that works good in European countries, such as Sweden and Norway. And I think that it's now high time that we join labor unions like the AFL, CIO, the UAW, citizens groups, to make sure that this is an idea whose time has come. I hope it'll end up in your, in your platform of this convention. I'm hoping that the Farmers Union can get to work on it. You might be interested to know that the Chamber of Commerce, representing the giant corporations of this country, was among the few witnesses 
who categorically opposed the idea during the Senate hearings last month. That's just one reason I think we ought to do it. I've always found that when they take a position, I'm generally on the other side. I think this is one we ought to sink our teeth in, into. Now, let me, let me close by saying that there are several things on the farm front that we ought not to lose sight of. And that means that we've got to work to strengthen this farm bill. It's a four-year farm bill, but that doesn't mean we have to wait until 1977 to get something done. That's why I said a few moments ago, we need to do something about this veto power. We need to make sure that we have the kind of strength in the Congress. You know, we've been overridden by 12 votes. By 24 votes, 12 votes would have changed the difference, would have made the difference. That's why we've got to start working, and I just want to say to you here that it's not just 76 that's around the corner, but 74 is right around the corner. And through, as I travel around the country, I'm going to keep reminding people that we don't dare wait four years to strengthen this bill. We've got the concept established. Now is the job to improve it, to make it a worthwhile and meaningful bill. Now, let me say we've got to have sensible international commodity agreements. We've got one right now for wheat that's meaningless, and if we had had it, if we had had it, then the things that Cy Carpenter talked to you about in terms of the Russian grain sale, that would have been a different ball game. And the Russians wouldn't have come over here at bargain basement prices and taken our wheat, the only supply in the whole world. And they came it away. They didn't buy it from us. We gave it to them at bargain basement prices. That's be and the reason for it, we didn't have pricing provisions in the wheat agreement. And the present agreement expires next June 30. And it's important that we get going on that issue. We're working hard on it. We need one for dairy, we need one for cotton, and we need one for feed grains. The administration is dragging its feet. The administration is opposed to it. They're going to the GATT negotiations. They're there now at the ministerial level. They'll really be going along about March when they start negotiating among all the nations of the, of the world. But the key thing to remember is that two countries but one of them was a great export country at times and an import country at times. Russia isn't in the GATT agreements. Neither is China. And that's why Farmers Union has been calling on this administration to do something about international commodity agreements. There's no other way to have a ball game where we can have orderly marketing and where we don't have to go to the business of producing too much, Henry, as you indicated a while ago, and then having the prices drop because we're going to try to dump them on somebody else's market. There's no reason why we can't have adequate minimums as well as maximums. But we've got to have minimums to make sure that we're going to be in the ball game and that we can stay in business and that farmers can make money in this country. That's the best way for the consumers of this country to be protected, is to make sure that farmers have the kind of income that keeps them in business. Another thing that, you know, every, every now and then the time is right. You know, it was right last, fall, last spring, you know, for the farm bill, a different, a, a different look at a farm bill. And let me tell you, now the time is right for a reserve bill. Farmers Union has talked about it so many, many years. I called Jim Patton here some weeks ago because the Rocky Mountain News, a conservative Scripps Howard paper, came out with an editorial and said, a world food bank is obviously needed. Its time has come. It took them 25 years to arrive at that position because 25 years ago they belittled and maligned Jim Patton for having the audacity of suggesting that maybe we ought to have a world food bank and maybe we ought to use food, you know, uh, as, as, a, as a device in the world to move toward peace and as a device for American farmers to have some protection price-wise. Well, 
We've got to stabilize our economy by dealing effectively with energy, the transportation, corporate power, the tax system that Ben talked about. I just want to say that there's a lot of work to do. And Ben put his finger on something he said several times as he was talking. Did you remember a year ago when we were uh, working on the telephone thing and a year ago on the tax thing? Here's a time I'm going to come to the Farmers Union and say that although we've gone haywire on the expense side and our expenses have gone up tremendously, obviously we're doing better on the income side. My friends, that's the time to really work to make sure it stays like this. There's no use worrying about that horse after he's stolen, you know. There's no use locking that barn door. Our challenge is to do those things now while times are on our side for a while. And let me say, this is the most difficult time for us. I'm not, I know I'm talking to the people who, like the preacher who says, well, I shouldn't be talking to you folks because you're here in church. And I'm talking to the fe people who believe it, who feel it down, down deep inside. But our challenge is all the greater because now we've got to work harder. We've got to work tougher while there's time to make sure that our friends understand that all of this good thing can be taken away so fast if an administration stands every day and picks away as they did on the 1974 feed grain program. And it doesn't make much difference because the price is going to be up, but it sets a precedent that means that in 1976 or 77, if we should get a little too much corn, they can then move down just like he did in 1974 when he announced this program. He could go to 130 million acres, but he, re but he said the payments were going to go to 88 million acres. That sets a precedent. That's what you call nickel and diming. Just like two days ago, three days ago, when the secretary appeared and said that on an emergency bill in case of a disaster for crops, he wanted to whittle it down and he called attention to the fact that some crops don't have bases like soybeans and gar and some others. It doesn't make any difference what the crop is. It's, if that's the crop you're growing and if you lose it because of some natural disaster, that's, that's a disaster. But the secretary every day is up on the hill whittling down, whittling away. And we're going to call his hand every chance we get. And every time we get, we're going to testify. And I ask you to do the same thing. When you know that they're whittling away at us, you, send, you start hollering out here in the country. It's no good just to holler from one place all the time. Because Butt says, well, that's just Tony Deschamps. He said, he's a critic of me. He opposed me and he's, a, he's against me. I remind him that there's a lot of Farmers Union people out there that feel the same way I do. If I didn't think you felt that way, if I didn't think you were behind me, I guess I wouldn't have the courage to stand up there and fight him as hard as I do. Because, that's why I say we've got more work to do. Let's do it together. I invite all of you to come to the National Convention in Milwaukee in March. It's going to be a great convention. And there we're going to really put together a program for 1974 to make sure that we don't get counted out. Thank you.